Hello and welcome to episode two of the Open Road podcast. Today we have Jack Parry and we also have Zach Clark from Rally Race Guys. Um, today we're going to be chatting about a bit about the club, um, latest news with cars and a little, about, little bit about each other. <laughs> on the uh, on the club front, Rob. Um, so we have now announced our first event, the Warwickshire Loop. Tickets have already sold out. Um, that will be happening on May twenty third on a Sunday. Um, it's a local event in Warwickshire. Uh, it will be an evening one, so it will probably last three or four hours. Um, we've got twenty five people coming. All twenty five tickets sold out in half an hour, which is crazy. I didn't think it would go that quick, but there we are. People seem excited to get out and about and doing stuff. Um, and because of how well received the first event has been, the second event is ready to go on the 3rd of June, another Sunday, and that will be the Cotswolds run. So that will be our first full full day event. Warwickshire Loop is just a half day, so it's three to four hours long. The full day event we plan to eke out at least over six or seven hours. A lot more miles, a lot more stops. So, yeah, that's where we are. Tickets will go live to that probably a little bit closer to the date compared to when the tickets went live for the 23rd of May, um, purely so people have a better idea of whether they'll be able to go. A bit of feedback that we've had this time around, people say, I wanted to get a ticket, but because it's quite a way ahead, they weren't 100% sure if they'd be able to get it off work. So we'll probably make tickets live two or three weeks before the 3rd of June. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much where we are. I think we're going to do similar numbers, so 25 cars or so. We're going to see what 25 cars is like on the first run, see if it's manageable, and go from there, really. Yeah, so it might change. Who knows? Um, yeah. So that looks... Even I didn't get a, a space on that. It was it, it booked out that quickly. I didn't even get a chance. I think I was at the pub at the time um, when it went live. So priorities... So um yeah so that that seems pretty like um well received actually and from the from what we've seen people were gutted that they didn't actually get on the first one um especially our mates like even our mates were well yeah. like worn well in advance and they missed them as well so yeah people, I, know. I hope they're not all minis rob sorry i hope they're not all minis they're not all minis there there are some minis uh Besides mine, there I think there were two, uh, okay. which is better. I say better, better than I thought in the sense that I mean I'm sad that there aren't more in a way, but at the same time I would like it's good to have variety. Um, and I'm, a lot of the following from the club has come from my main Instagram account, so hence there are a lot of minis that are following it. But it is good to have a nice variety. So when we do promo shoots and photos and stuff, it'll you know a good mix of cars. And there's a really awesome mix of cars for the first run uh everything from polos to an r34 gtr so there's a lot of variety so it should be good to see them all out on the road at the same time and definitely. yeah definitely jack will you uh, be attending any of the open road club events depends how it depends how north you come depends how uh depends how far you're stretching it out no i definitely will be um Definitely will be that 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 North Wales ones looks interesting. Um, I think your plans to a we plan to a York uh, Yorkshire Dales run, Rob. Uh, we'd like to. The furthest north we've got so far is the Peak District. So yeah, that's, that's, be, that's, not, that's closest. Not good for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to do Yorkshire. I've got in the plans one to do the Lake District. The only thing is, it is a long way to go in a day. Mm. Um, it's doable, but it is a lot of miles. So I'd like to, depending on how well these first few events go, and provided they're well received and that they actually run smoothly, I mean, as I said, we haven't done one yet. We still want to make sure that this works as a proper concept and doesn't end up being free for all or too manic to you know deal with the numbers of cars. But hopefully, if it does work, I'd like to do weekend events where it's spread out over a couple of days, i.e., say, head up on the Friday evening be there all day Saturday and head back home on the Sunday evening kind of thing. 
So I think if I was to do one that far north, it would be uh, a multi-day event rather than just a single day thing. Yeah, that sounds that sounds that sounds better. I think, and to be honest, mate, I don't think you'll have any problems selling tickets out, especially for a week and stuff, because people want to get away and they want to have any excuse to to get out as far as they can. I think I think twenty five cars will seem like more when you've got them all together. I think it'll seem like quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, I've done quite a few runs before with mini clubs, um, and in the Peak District, I think the the biggest number we saw was like eighty five, and it's great fun to see eighty five cars going down the road, but logistically, it was a bit of a pain. I wasn't the one organising it, but just being part of it, we essentially just created a traffic jam wherever we went. Yeah, it creates a lot of attention as well. Yeah, to, to a point where you're not really enjoying the roads because you you just sat at 20 in a big jam all day. Mm. So I think if we keep it to around 25 as a maximum, it will make the day a bit more smooth and a yeah, more manageable. I, th- I think, I think it keeps it kind of exclusive as well. Yeah. And doesn't it like, there's obviously positives and negatives with that. The positive side being it's small, it's ex- it's exclusive, but not exclusive, if you know what I mean. Anyone can get on there, but when you are on there, it feels a bit more special because there's only a select number of cars rather than feeling like a rolling car show. And like you said, just getting caught up in a traffic jam wherever you go. So I don't think that's yeah, exactly. a bad thing. Sorry, go on. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing at all that there's only 25 cars. If anything, it's a positive. Yeah, I mean... The amount of messages I got soon after the tickets went live, mostly from closer friends, and I can see why they do it. I'm sure I did the same, but they sort of say, "Oh, go on, let me, let me, let me on," you know. But if I do that, if I make one rule for one person, when you stop, well, yeah. you know. So unfortunately, it is a case that if you don't get a ticket, you won't be on that one. And on that on that note, if you do get on a run, um. The way really the information for the main day will happen is that the night before um, you will get information on the specific route and the timings for the run itself. We don't want to post the exact route that we're doing and the exact times to try and stop people who haven't got tickets just piggybacking onto the event. Because that could end up, you know, turning 25 cars into 50 cars before you know it. Mm. So if you do get a ticket and you do get the emails, the evening before please keep like the link to yourself because if you just give it to one mate then they'll give it to another mate and before you know it it's, it's got out of hand um and if you are ever like suspected of giving away route information like that then you just won't be allowed to enter any other runs it's as simple as that definitely definitely yeah, it's fair um, enough. yeah. it's 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 logical, obviously. If people want to get on it, it's a sought after. But yeah, like you, you yeah. get you, you get your turn. Um, yeah, this is the first one, and it sold out. So, um, and there'll be a lot more to come, hopefully, um, as long as we don't piss the police off and other people off as well, because we don't want to make a bad day for ourselves, do you, Rob? No, no, of course not. I mean, we, we want to make sure that we can do these events for as long as possible. Um, and the main the main way that we can ensure that is just to be sensible. So, you know, don't be driving like an idiot, essentially. Don't be a dick, as caffeine machine always say. All right. we, we'll, we're on public roads, you know, wherever we go, we don't own the land we're on. Same for the car parks, we don't own that land. So if you have to pay at a car park, make sure you pay. If we're going on a road, make sure you keep within the limits, you know. The last thing we want is the police getting on our backs or locals ringing up saying big group of cars just blasted through the village because they'll always over exaggerate it. So we've got to be careful. It only takes one person with a camera to ruin the whole thing. It does. It does. But also uh, the same thing we want to uh, have posts about it and I want, we, we want social media presence as well. So yeah, it yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm more like if a, a Karen film, someone doing something stupid is, is, yeah. what, is more what I mean. So just sort of remember, whenever you're on one of the runs, just remember that you are a representative of the club. So anything that you do, people outside the club will just assume that everyone does it. So if you go and do a big burnout, they'll assume that everyone does it. 
So, yeah, just keep it safe, keep it sensible. That's all we ask. Yeah. What other news have you got, Rob, about the club? Um, so we've just launched our new logo. Yeah. Uh, with thanks to my mate Liam, uh, M12LGO on Instagram. Um, it's an awesome little logo. With just, it's sort of simple text, the Open Road Club, with a little sort of circular logo next to it with a little road twisting It'll through. It'll be on the screen somewhere. Sorry? It'll yes. be on the screen somewhere. On the screen somewhere there. And, um, yeah. And we finalised those designs yesterday. Um, and already we are in the process of turning them into stickers. We're just working out sizes because at the moment it is quite a long and quite thin sticker. So if it's like 12 centimetres, which is a not a sort of semi decent size, it still looks quite small because it's quite thin. So we're, we're trying to work out a rough size, but somewhere between 15 and 20 centimetres long is where we think the sweet spot will be. Uh, but we're just doing prototypes at the moment. I hope that by the first run, um, I'll bring stickers so each person on the first run gets a free sticker. Sounds good. Sounds good. I I, I like the um I, I obviously saw the drafts and stuff like that, but yeah, it's uh, definitely looks cool. Looks cool. Have you seen the um it Jack? Yeah, look good. I saw it today actually for the first time. I think it's decent. You've got a uh, a logo going on as well, and and with stickers to get people like. Representing on their cars as well. Are we, are we going to get a, a colour variation or are we stuck with one colour at the minute? Yeah, yeah. So we're going to go for two sticker styles. So one is like a stencil style. So what I mean by that is that the you've got you've got the logo itself made out of whatever material it is, and that could be like a white colour or a red colour. And then the background is essentially like the window that it's on or the car panel that it's on. And then the other style will be uh, like a background sticker so it will be a solid sticker with like black text and then a white background but again we can swap and change the colors but if you wanted just like a red one to match your red car or a white one to be visible on the window then yeah so we're going to plan to do different colors to match different cars sounds good nice. mm -hmm. well uh I guess what i saw on the road today go on it was a yaris gr <laughs> did you look did look pretty good. Yeah, it was, mm -hmm. in, it was in Coventry. And I've, got, I've got an unhealthy obsession for that car. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I uh, was at Cafe Machine over the weekend, I saw at least four different types. Um, and it's definitely going to be the, the mini replacement. I'd say in about a year, let, let them depreciate a little bit. Because at the moment, they're going for overlist at like 40 grand. If you want one right now, I've seen it. Red, red line in North Yorkshire's got one at forty-two thousand pounds. Ow! Yeah, yeah. it's done nine hundred miles, but it's still forty-two thousand pounds. <laughs> I um, know, but you know, you are going to find someone wanting to buy it, so I don't blame them for putting up that price. Yeah, and yeah. Shoe box for that as well for 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 forty-two grand. It's a big, it's a big car though because it's sort of it's going. It's going the opposite way to where you think that the car industry might be going at the minute. It's got obviously technological points, you know, it's only got the three cylinder and whatever, and but just little aspects like you pull the handbrake and the rear the the rear drive shaft disconnects. It's like yeah. like why would you need that for anything else but for doing handbrake turns? You don't like that's it's just it's just nice to see that the manufacturers letting their hair down a little bit and letting the engineers do what they want to do instead of making hybrids and stuff like that yeah they've got boxes to tick with emissions and all sorts of stuff but like, given these little projects they they can show what they really want to do am i right i think it's someone's got 400 horsepower out of one um i know litchfield are doing stuff i don't know whether it was them that got 400 i know that litchfield are pushing over 300 pretty easy with uh, a tuning pack that i think they're developing um but yeah, 400 might be right. I mean, Toyota say I think they're, what, 270 out the box. And commonly, Japanese companies always underestimate the power of it. I imagine if you were to get one. Yeah. I imagine if you were to get one and put it on a diner, they'd probably do 275, 280 out of the box as they are. Which for a three-cylinder is crazy power. Yeah, it's nuts. I know, I know someone who's got one. My, my mate, Dan, at Pyramus Speed, they've got a white one in the development car. And yeah. 
I've had a poke around that and it, they look so much better in the flesh. They look, they just, like, the presence is unbelievable. He says there's a yep. couple of annoying points where if you are over, I don't know, about five foot eight with a helmet on, your head touches the roof. <laughs> yeah. And the passenger seat doesn't have a lever to, to, to be able to lower the seat down. Oh, really? So it's just, it's just fixed at one height? Fixed height seat, which I think is really annoying. It's the same as my van. <laughs> it's like what, how much how much more effort would it have been to put a, to, to put that in? Do you know what I mean? It's some some niggly little bits like that, but yeah, a lot of the positives outweigh those outweigh those the, the smaller issues. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it, as you say, it's it's rare that companies make cars for car people these days. Outside of paying big money for super performance cars, there aren't many. They say budget. It's not a budget car. It's a lot of money, but compared to other cars of similar capability, it's a bit of a bargain as modern day cars go. Um, like the fact that it's just four wheel drive, nearly 300 horsepower manual, and you can vary the power from, you know, from front to rear where you can go 60, 40, 50, 50, or 70, 30. It's just an absolute hoon of a little car. And it's great to see a, a modern day manufacturer making it in this day and age with electric becoming the norm and as you say hybrids and all that stuff clouding it around us it's nice to see that i think toyota have made a last hurrah really i hope that, I hope that people aren't scared of putting miles on them i hope people don't, yeah. don't think i've got one i'm going to do a thousand miles a year in it and then i'm going to sell it for over list in 18 months time I mean, yeah you could do that but it just kind of missing missing the missing the point a little bit and you know it'd be nice to see them come down a little bit in price and let other people have a go in them. That isn't the owner's priority. I'm sure they want to keep, they want to keep as much value in the car as possible, but yeah. they shouldn't, they shouldn't be garage Queens. It isn't like going out and buying a, a 488 where you, you know that every thousand miles it depreciates. It's just an unbelievable amount. Yeah. They, well, no, they're not going to depreciate. They are going to, they are appreciating. Um, yeah. But yeah, I hope people get out and, drive them and stuff It'd be interesting to see like a lot of people have jumped a lot of tuners have jumped on the bandwagon of tuning them and it'd be interesting to see how many people actually go forward with that because obviously a lot of people wait until after three years warranty etc etc yes but it depends how lenient the manufacturer is i think you know i've done a lot of work to my car and it went in for its final service on the service pack of mini mm -hmm. and i gave them a hypothetical situation of if this went wrong with all the stuff I've done to my car, what would you say? And they said, as long as it doesn't directly affect your warranty claim, we're not bothered. Like, we'll fix it for you. Yeah, I, I remember you saying to me about that. For those who don't already know, me and Jack both own F56 John Cooper Works. Is I think it very much depends what relationship you got with, with your dealer and which dealer you're with. Because in my situation, it was, it was the opposite. So I, I rang up to casually, I think it was to book in for a service or something. And I said casually, I just I got the car in to get some lowering springs, just a 30 mil drop. And she said, is that on your suspension? Bit of an odd question. But I was like, yes, why? And she's like, oh, well, that voids your handling and suspension warranty. I was like, for, for lowering springs? She's like, yep. And she said, have you done, any, done anything else? And I should have just shut my mouth. But I said, yeah, I've done the exhaust as well. And, she's, and she said, oh, well, unfortunately, that, that voids your engine warranty as well. So for two, for two things. An exhaust, which I just took out the resonator, and a 30 mil um, lowering spring kit, and that's basically voided the most important parts of my warranty. So it, yeah. it, it pretty much depends what who you're with and whether think, they care that think, much. I think if you had a serious issue and you and you took that further, to, especially to Mini UK as well, they would they they they'd end up doing it under warranty. That's a that's a classic case of somebody who doesn't know that much and. Mm. You know, because if you bring your car to a dealership and they do warranty work on it, that has to go through the system. That has to be, yeah. there's a procedure to do that. They can't just do willy nilly, like, they don't just free to do what they want, it has to go through a procedure. And mm -hmm. it is a bit weird to think that one dealership won't do what another one would do. I mean, every single warranty claim I've had on that car has been fixed. Yeah. It's been in for a lot, like, it's been <laughs> in for a fair amount of stuff especially yeah. at the start as well. 
Um, and I find it a little bit rich from Mini saying things like that when you can buy a Pro Exhaust and the Pro Suspension Kit, which which are more extreme versions of what you've done. Yeah. But keep, but, but keep your warranty. It's sort of, it doesn't. It's it doesn't really add up. So I wouldn't worry I, too much. I wouldn't worry too much. Yeah, I think the only reason that Mini might get on someone's back if they were to do a similar thing to me might just be, as you said, because there is a version of that that you can get from Mini. Yeah. It might be that they're kind of anti any anyone else just to make sure that you buy their own product. Mm -hmm. Just so it's got a Mini badge on it. Yeah. But, we, and also, I know that BMW are quite the opposite to what I have just said. I know they are very strict with um, things done on their performance cars. You know, yeah. they they read ECUs now and they can tell whether it's had a tuning box on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, the, the, you know, the ECU will log, even though the whole selling point of a tuning box is to, is to sort of keep it under the radar and trick the ECU into thinking it's doing something else so it doesn't log it. it that isn't the case anymore. No, they've got very hot on... I think it's because big YouTubers and other people on social media have made it such a common place to go and get a finance car and do crazy mods to it and then quickly swap it back before they give the car back that that these dealers have realised what they're doing so they are being more proactive on checking these vehicles when they come back, which makes sense, especially if it's on a finance agreement and you're giving it back at the end of the term. They want mm. to make sure their car's in working condition and hasn't been, you know, ragged the living shit out of for the last however many years. So you can understand from their point of view why they're doing it. But yes, it, it, it does mean that it's a lot harder to do things now because a lot more companies are saying no to mods on, on finance cars. Especially, well, I don't blame them if something's gone wrong with your engine. So you've, you've mapped it and in case of know, M3s, M4s, you know, f 80s stuff, if, yeah. you know, if, the crank, if the crank hub sends, uh, the crank hub goes. It's a common problem and it's to do with your engine. It's all to do with that. So, but what I would find harsh is if you had a problem with your head unit and you'd put in a crap of pitch exhaust on it and they said, no, your warranty's void. Yeah. I think mean, that's, that's, I think that's pretty harsh. I don't think it would be, I don't think it would be that difficult to just go to a different dealer and have it done there. Yeah. Well, but, when she said that, I was it was coming up to the warranty ending anyway. Um, so I ended up just getting a warranty with a with a third party. And at no point when I made when I made that account did they ask about modifications or anything like that. And this warranty that I've now got covers quite a bit more, I think, than the mini warranty that I had. Seems to definitely have more boxes ticked when it comes to things that go wrong. Um, so yeah, that's that's where we are. So I'm not with the mini warranty anymore, but I have got a warranty in case things do go wrong. Because yeah. it's an extension car if it does go. They tried to sell me an extension on mine for some absolute extortion of price. It was just yeah, insane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Rob, you need to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to stop, like stop talking. Stop telling people what I'm doing. Yeah. 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 Just, just keep it. If, I, if I hadn't yeah. said anything on that phone call, I probably wouldn't have had this problem, but it is what it is. But then again, if if, she, if they were to then stick to their word on that, and I hadn't mentioned it then, and I then go in for warranty work later down the line, and they were to refuse me later down the line. Then... But yeah, you could almost uh, plead ignorance. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's not yeah. morally right, but you've paid for a warranty so why not get like sort of the, the money's worth out of it i guess either, yeah either that rob while you drive to Stratstone in leeds to have your warranty work done yeah come up to get it done there yeah, yeah. they were they they've loved having my car in there and they always do everything that i ever ask mm -hmm. I, I, honestly i've had so much stuff i've had updates on the head unit i've had paint work fixed i've had uh like issues with real lights, I've had issues with like the, the bonnet warping, all sorts of stuff. And they've just said, yeah, we'll just do it there and then. Yeah. Fair enough. As I said, I think I think different dealers have different attitudes and but there have been other times where I've had issues with the dealer that I'm with. Um I don't think I'll go a, go and get a car through them again. 
put it that way. I won't. I, I won't come. Go on. I was gonna say I've heard issues of the mini dealerships not fitting non-run flats to cars that have to come in run flats. Really? Yeah. Genuinely. I mean, I, I don't have run flats on mine now. I've got Michelin PS4s, of which I now need to go and order two because my fronts were overinflated. So <laughs> they've suffered from overinflation wear, so I need to get some two new ones. But that, that's well, pretty bad. I don't think Mini would fit them. I think if you said to Mini, have a Mini, can you fit me two Pilot Spot 4s, please? They'd say, mm. no, the car should come with run flats. Yeah. Which is just ridiculous. First thing I did was pull the run flats off it. I think I drove it home. I think it had four miles on it, my car. I think I'd already bought some suspension for it. And I drove yeah. it home. And these tires are absolutely dog shit. And got home and ordered some parts about four. Put on. Yeah, they were horrible. I mean, when I got my car, so it had done 14,000 miles. And it had the same tires from, from you. Um, and I thought I might as well get the money out of them. And I had them, how long did I have them on? Maybe five months or so. And then got these PS4s and then night and day. It's like I could tell that the car didn't handle particularly amazingly on, on these P7 run flat Pirellis. Mm. But I didn't realize quite how bad they were until I put on the PS4s and the car just felt completely different. Yeah. I mean, what you should do now really is jump to a 17 inch wheel and then put an even smaller and chunkier tire on it. And get some get wider tires because I've only got 205s and they're so skinny. Hey, that, changed, that changed it again. It's yeah. so best thing I've ever done to that car is dropping down to a 17 inch wheel. Yeah. 100%. It's basically the first thing I tell everyone to do. I like to buy some decent suspension and drop to a 17 inch wheel and put some tires on it and you will you will love it. It's so, yeah. much, so, so, so much better. I've got one there. I've got a 17 inch. <laughs> you mean one dynamic there? Yeah. That's, that's my, that's my mini challenge. Um, not the production car, but this, the the challenge car. There's the other cars that support the BTCC. Yeah, yeah. That's off. That's off one of them. It was on eBay, and someone sent me a link and said, "You don't buy this if you watch me." So I turned up at my house about three days later. <laughs> nice. How much did you get that for? I think it was like eighty quid. Huh. Can't complain for that. Eighty quid. So I thought, yes, yeah, I'm. I can sit in the bedroom. Nice one. Yeah. So, uh, so, so on that note, you want to uh, introduce to everyone a bit about what you do, Jack, and who you are, and yeah. What you've got. So, so, obviously, by now you should know my name's Jack. Um, day to day, I'm a track design engineer um, in York, so I design um, railways and, and track track renewals um, and things like that. I've always been sort of into cars ever since I was younger and the people who used to hang around with at school and stuff and it all sort of developed from that. There's, there's previous engineering people like my dad and my granddad in my, in my family so it's always just come from that really. Um, and then I did sixth form, left sixth form when I went to university uh, and I studied um, motorsport engineering um, at university, did that and then I got a job building gearboxes for Formula One cars um, we did that for five years. Um, Who was that with? Uh, PDS, PDS Racing, it was called. Um, so we would we were doing that, and then for three of the five years, with uh, through that, we were doing the um, Dutch Supercar Challenge um, all, all over Europe, uh, which was fun as well. So we would, I was in and out of Europe doing that and building gearboxes Monday to Friday. So it was pretty good. Um, did that for five years um, and then Corona hit um, and the motorsport world got strangled unfortunately um, so we had to make a change and then I got myself um, a proper job as my mum would call it um, a, career, a career as such but so through through that I've always I've always been in the cars and stuff even though I don't have a job that's anything to do with cars anymore now it's kind of refreshing to not talk about cars at work and then leave that for the weekend and evenings and stuff like that. Um, previously, I've had Fiesta STs um, and things like that. I had a couple of Fiesta STs, um, stage one, one, which was, which was great. And then actually 
sort of coming towards the end of that with with that car. Um, I don't think I actually wanted to get rid of it at the time. I think I was, I think I was quite happy with it. And then, for some reason, I ended up going into a an, into a mini dealership that went in, in Leeds, Strathstone one, and I ended up I ended up going for a test drive in one. I think I was just I think I think I think I've literally just walked into the dealership. I had a bit of spare time and I was just poking around one. And someone came over and said, "Would you like to go on a test drive?" I, so I had my wallet on me with my driving license. And I said, "Yeah, of course I can." Um, I went for a drive. And I just thought this is this is really nice. I really like this. It felt like a really big step up from the ST. But both interior, it had like had BMW build quality. I found out that that's a lot of rubbish. Worse build quality than I had previously. But I was sold on I was sold on the face of it. Um, I knew that it wasn't perfect, and it didn't like they come like a monster truck out of the factory with the ride out and stuff. But I knew that it wouldn't take a lot to to fix them. And I ended up, yeah, I ended up putting a deposit down on one. Um, and my car actually is the last one off the production line at Oxford before they started making the LCI version. Oh, really? So they had to sell my build slot to be able to move on. So they had to tick the last build slot to yeah. then move on and be able to start. Oh, they had a gap, actually. They, they stopped producing them for a little bit before they made the, the LCI ones. Um mm-hmm. Which means I was able to wangle a deal that basically said, "Well, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You need you need this last build slot gone. The factory are waiting to start the production on the LCI stuff. So the sooner I sign this piece of paper, the sooner you can do that. Um, yeah. Which means uh, I got the car at a really good deal. To be fair, the salesman actually turned the screen around on his computer and said and pointed at the number that said zero profit for dealership in the car. He sold it. He sold it at cost." Wow. Um, yeah. So, so I couldn't say no at that point. So I signed the piece of paper and then I had one, I think, six weeks later. I think it got built and then drove up here and then I had one six weeks later. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's just, just been chipping away doing stuff like that for for the past three years, three and a bit, three and a bit years I've had it. And mm-hmm. it's the best car I've best car I've had by by far. Um Mod started to get a little bit extreme, so I had to buy a daily. Um, and also with my change of job as well, I'm doing nearly 100 mile round trip now every day. No oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't fancy putting that those those miles on the mini. So mini sits in the garage now, um, waits to come out on a weekend or a bank holiday or something. Um, mm-hmm. Makes it a bit more special. It means I can go a bit further with mods and stuff like that. You know, just put some new tires on it and and. I don't fancy driving them in the in the wet, so it means I can just leave it leave it for summer, keep it special, and yeah. So it get it sees it sees a trip out every now and then to caffeine machine, yeah. Uh, every now and then, but no, it just it just feels special every time I drive it. There's some good there's some good bits on it now, like the, the cooler work shifter in it, which you don't see many F fifty sixes with, um, and I know why because it was horrible to fit. It was, it was it was just an absolute pain. I think it took it took it took my friend and I two two nights to fit it. And I've got a video on my phone of me trying to put it into reverse at like twenty to four in the morning. It just wouldn't it just would not go in, and I could not get it to work. Whole yeah. whole whole interior job out. It was just um, yeah. But it was it, but it was worth it. And yeah, I've got some other bits on it now, and it's um, all pretty good. KW suspension. Makes a big difference. Dropping down to a seventeen-inch wheel makes a big difference. Uh, Nankang NS two Rs. Take the back seats out, um, and I've got a lot of suspension stuff to go on now. I've just booked it in at A Reeve Performance, um, so it's it's got a rear anti roll bar to go on, uh, lower control arms, poly bushes to go in the front adjustable drop links top mounts it's it's going a bit far now but it's going to be it'll be, it'll be good when it's done yeah because that sounds quite a package in there um with the you said about taking rear seats me and zach had good fun uh was it last weekend taking <laughs> trying to get them out two weeks ago two weeks ago yeah. two weeks ago yeah main, main reason for me being was just because of corona i'm not going to have anyone in the car 
for a good foreseeable future. And I thought I might as well take them out and make it a bit more practical and at the same time a little bit lighter. Um, but when so we did that at the same time as installing a dash cam and um, ended up flagging the airbag warning light because we took the um, to access we, we had to like try and hide the wiring for the dash cam yeah um, and where we had to earth it into the onto the body of the car was behind the panel where there's that little key for the child airbag lock yeah. in hindsight we should have disconnected the battery before doing that but we didn't and then when we went to turn the car back on, the car was saying passenger airbag failure, seek a service centre. Um, <laughs> thankfully, now managed to get that code wiped. But um, yeah. Have you taken all this stuff out the bottom of the boot as well? Um, no. The bottom of the boot. Take no. That. So, so yeah. the boot, it's got, it's got like that, it's got that, that double layered thing where you've got like a yeah. little panel. Yeah. And thing. So I hide all of, I've got like some high vis is in a safety one of the safety triangles and that sort of thing hidden down under there so i've left that in to hide that stuff honestly take all that stuff out take the carpeted bit out because there's a carpeted segment as well on the bottom of it which you can lift yeah up. take all that out and go for a drive it's so much louder oh the exhaust oh, yeah no. it is so much louder it is considerably it is honestly it's noticeably louder i've got nothing in the back of mine mine's completely stripped out in back now yeah, Not, nothing at all, and it's so loud. Um, I was gonna say, just, just taking the rear seats out, there was a, a, a noticeable difference in yeah. in the exhaust. Yeah, but that 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 double layered carpet thing in the back really does make a big difference. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so if you just throw your safety stuff away and make it louder. <laughs> no, need safety, okay. got, safety third. <laughs> What what exhaust has your got on it then? Is, have you cut the res out as well, or are you got the pro exhaust? No, I had the I got, I got the pro exhaust. Um, I had well, I bought the I brought the bought the pro suspension before I even had the car. Um, I had that I had that fitted. Um, that's an expensive bit of kit for what it is. Um, in hindsight, there isn't really much point buying the pro suspension. Because it doesn't actually go that low, to be fair. I think you're probably about the same as if you bought some springs. Yeah. Uh, and you can probably save yourself 1,500 quid. Because, the, yeah, I know the suspension is not cheap at all. It's really expensive. Yeah. Um, so I had that and then mini fitted it as well. And I think they drive probably £100 an hour of labour. Yeah, your pants mm -hmm. down. Um, and then, I, so now I've got the pro exhaust. And it's it is good. It is the bit it is the bit of kit you should have on the fifty six. Um it's a bit that people want. However, I've heard a couple with res deletes and there ain't there ain't much in it really. Hmm. Noise wise there ain't much in it. The pro exhaust is louder, but is it how much are pro exhaust going for now? A thousand quid? No no, I mean you no, you can still pick them up for like twelve hundred, thirteen hundred, some are going for. And how much are res delete? Two hundred quid? Yeah, if that. No, I think uh, so. I, I went. I, I had it done. I was lazy, so I had it done a Deutsche check, and I think they charged uh, one hundred and fifty quid. That's really good. Actually, they, 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 they just cut it out, weld in a new bit of metal, and that plus labour was one hundred and fifty quid. Yeah, it's a good deal. Let's be fair. Um, yeah, obviously you've got the option of the of the valve in it, um, which is good. I use. I know a lot of people that just the first thing they do is open the valve, which. I think, well, why didn't you just get a straight for exhaust then? Because the only time it's closed is when the car's off. Um, yeah. It's nice. To, it is really nice to have the option, to be fair. On the motorway, you want it as quiet as possible. Um, those NS2Rs are pretty noisy on the motorway. But yeah. you, you, can close, you can close the valve. Um, no, I think it's got I think it's got every pro bit on it, apart from the suspension, which it used to have. Um, mm -hmm. and I sold those and went to some KW V2s. Um, which got Very good. Really in them and yeah, play around with those. You were looking at them, weren't you, Rob? But well, you yeah, yeah. I think if I was planning on keeping the mini longer than I am, I would have invested more in stuff like that. Mm. But in my mind, if I'm going to be getting rid of the car in a year or so, 
I just can't see why I want to go and spend that much money to then probably have to take it off because a lot of people don't really like to buy modified cars, really. In yeah. general, I think they'll, it will sell better stock or at least as it is right now compared to when it did more. I think if you were to sell your car, you wouldn't even, I don't think it's worth taking the bits off it, to be perfectly honest, mate. It really isn't. The, the, the bits that you've done are the tasteful bits that people would want to do anyway. Like, like the deep. Car and go, it hasn't, it hasn't got the rubbish run flats. It's a little bit lower, a little bit louder. There you go. Done. Yeah. yeah less pro. That, that's what people are going to want. And you're going to just pay dead dead money, i.e. the labour, to have it all reversed again. So I'd probably just sell it as it is, mate. Someone will buy it. Yeah. Someone will definitely It'll end up being me taking it off anyway. <laughs> yeah, if anything needs changing back, it will be in your unit to do it. Uh so out outside of the few bits that Deutsch Tech have done, basically any, any anything that needs doing to his to my car ends up going to Zach, whether it's the MX5 or the Mini or I think you know, I get it's a or if it's for servicing. Yeah, I get a weekly text of of, of a broke something or bought something. <laughs> yeah, either <laughs> yeah, either something's broken or I've seen this on eBay. Yeah. Do you know what I never I, I never understood really the the whole MX5 thing. Never really yeah. got, never really got it. Never really understand it. And then, however, I drove a. I don't know what the series is called. Is it the MX Five Cup? MX Five Cup? Is that right? I think that's a variant. Do you know what year it was? Or roughly. What was yeah. it? A pop up headlight boy, or was it a normal fixed headlight one? No, no, it was, uh, it was fixed headlight, and it had a cage in the back of it. I think it was probably yeah. about like a weight one. That's okay, the, Mark uh, three, that yeah. Be, yeah. Mark three, yeah. That sounds that sounds about right. Um, I drove a track one of those at Donington. Yeah, and I just get it now. Yeah, I just get it. I just get it. I it think was so, it was so easy. Honestly, it was so easy. It loved to rev. It was a hot day at Donington. It it just it just loved it. Yeah, absolutely loved it, and it was so predictable as well. Like it was just, it was just fun and it wasn't and it wasn't so fast that you thought it was going to kill you it was just it yeah was just really, really good fun i think any mx5 whether you buy a, a mark one which are the which is like the cult classics or whether you buy a brand new one they all come out the box so well engineered and honed in already that you modify it, it some of the things that you can do to it to modify it almost in a way ruin it because the the engineers in japan just know what they're doing when it comes to making a driver's car they're just so good and as you say so easy to drive well and they love to rev out so you feel like you're getting every inch of power out of it you can rev it all the way to the red line which is completely different to the mini because the mini is very torque low end torque based so you end up short shifting mm. the mx5 you, you rinse it in every gear I, i've got a mark ii a broken mark ii um, it's yes yeah hopefully by the end of may it'll be out on the road again but it's just such an a nice almost back to basics car it's not a classic car it was made in 99 but at the same time it hasn't got all the modern gizmos so it doesn't have abs uh, it has power steering but it is quite heavy um, power steering um, no rev matching you know you have to do everything yourself and it's nice to get into a car where you it's more rewarding when you get it right because there isn't a computer helping you it's all on you yeah. so yeah it's a nice little car. I'm just going to double check that it was a Mark III. I'm pretty sure it was a Mark III. I think yeah, oh wait, Mark III. So I think people are going to rinse me if I get this wrong. Up until like the end of 99 was the Mark I. I'm not sure when they yeah, started. Yeah, it was that, yeah. And then like end of 99 through to like 2000 and I want to say three or four was the Mark II. And then there was a bit of a gap, I think. And then around 2006 onwards, I think, was the Mark III for a couple of years. And then most recently was their Mark IV that came out about two, three years ago. Mm. So, yeah, there are four generations, and the one that everyone, like, lusts after is the Mark I because of the pop-ups. Mm. But I've, I've driven a Mark I, I've driven a Mark II, and to be fair, I think, um, dynamically, the two is, is the better driving of the two. But everyone just loves the Mark One because pop-up headlights are cool. Yeah, I'd like to have a go in a in a in a new one or failing that one. Yeah. Um, 
a bath one two four spiders. Yeah, they're very cool looking cars. I'd like to go one of those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see what that's about. I think underneath the the one two four and the MX five are pretty similar. I mean, what they're they're both they're, they're both four pots rear wheel drive front engine similar weight. Yeah, I, I, yeah, they're they're good, but you have to work for it. It's not like a modern car, like we were saying last night. With with like the likes of like your Jake John who works, obviously he might be under the. You put your foot down and you just go, but to to throw it around a corner like an MX Five or um, something like that, you've got to work for it, and it's arguably more rewarding than just putting your foot down. You, yeah, you don't get the thrill factor, but. You, you you get the, the the smile as everybody wants. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, so I, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to steal a point made on one of Car Throttle's most recent podcasts, and they were talking about car crashes and that sort of thing. And they made the very good point that I think the reason a lot of people crash these days due to speed is just because it's so easy in a modern car to go fast. A lot of modern cars, especially if you get like a modern day SUV, they're auto, a big power. And you can just get up to speed so quickly. Whereas if you were to go and try and do the same speed in something stripped back like an MX-5, it would take a lot of effort to do it. So I think naturally, if you've got a car that has less driver range, you'll naturally, most of the time, drive it slower and safer, just because it requires a lot more skill and involvement to drive it quickly. I think, get, I think a lot of modern cars give you a false sense of security. Yeah. What they can't, and what, what those cars can't adapt to is... Uh, changing weather conditions, other people as well, um, you know, road surface and stuff like that. Whereas if you're driving around in a Mac 1 MX-5 and it starts to rain and you kind of need some new tyres, those things add up in your brain and you go, I'm going to take it steady. But if yeah. you're in a, I don't know, if you're in like a, I don't know, let's just take a, a Range Rover SVR, for example, and you come around a roundabout, flying through a roundabout that you know off by at 80 mile an hour, because you know it'll stick. It weighs get off for three tons in its four-wheel drive. You know it's you can just take it, but someone's dumped a lot of coolant because there's been an accident. You're just going to end up up a curb. Yeah, yeah. The SVR on on the point of SVR, I, I was blown away by how quick that car is. Like you hear the figures and you hear that it's a five-liter V8. So in your mind, it's quick. Um, and I was at a set of lights in Birmingham in the John Cooper works, and this SVR pulled up behind, pulled up to the side of me, and he sort of. I couldn't really see him, but he, he revved a little bit. I was like, all right, go on then. Put it in sport mode. And I got what I thought was quite a good launch and quite a good get up and go. And the, the SVR just went. And for a two and a half plus ton car, it was just outstanding to see something with that much weight just disappear. It just walked all over the John Cooper works like I was standing still. I think I think I see about three a day now. Every, every other man and his dog's got an SVR. Yeah. If you if, if you can afford to finance the thing and you can afford to put, put fuel in it, which is the main yeah. thing, um, I've 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 been in a couple of them and the thing that takes me back more than the speed is how horribly stiff it is. Yeah, it's, it's so hard. It, it's like it's like JLR have just gone. Oh, let's just put some concrete in shocks. <laughs> Otherwise, the thing won't go around the corner. And honestly, it is rock hard. No, fair. I hadn't it's heard that. Sort of, it's sort of like RS3 hard. Like it just feels like you're gonna, like it's you dip down a pothole and you cringe. Yeah. It's like oh, it's cracked a wheel. Oh, it's cracked a wheel. It's just mm-hmm. that's, that's the one thing that I when I had to go in one, I was just like, this is horrible. <laughs> yeah. That the uh, one thing about my mini that I don't like in a way. And I guess this is where the benefit of going in and spending more on coilovers is 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 where it's at, really, is that these lowering springs, well, it's a 30 mil drop, so it reduces the travel of the spring by 30 mil. Um, and when you're going along a bumpy road at speed, you do notice that because the suspension is quite crashy. Um, you sort of end up being a bit all over the place as you're going down the road, bouncing around and with the torque steer as well, the car can get unsettled quite quickly. Um, so that is, if I had to say one negative about the Mini, on lowering springs, at least, the suspension is quite firm and crashy on a bumpy road at speed. I'd say a contributor to that is probably tyre profile as well. Yes, yeah, so they're, they're 40. And also being over-inflated probably didn't help. 
Yeah, 40 and on a big ish wheel, you know, it's an 18 inch wheel. You're probably not going to go any bigger than that on a hatchback. No, you, 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 you feel that, you feel that through the wheel and through the suspension. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, which is all the things I got when I drove mine home that day. It was like, right, this needs to change. Yeah, yeah. I say out the box, the suspension is a bit too high. Um, but if you go in, as you say, go and do simple things like suspension and tyres, the Mini is such a good car to drive. Mm. I don't know what they were thinking when they put on those run flats and why they were made, like, and why they made so thin. But outside of tyres and suspension, they're pretty much perfect as hot hatches go. Mm. Yeah, I don't really know why you'd go to that length of developing the thing and making it really good and then just just put some run flats on it it's like well no because the only thing that's actually doing anything contact wise is, is is the tire like there's nothing else in between your car and the road apart from the tire but yeah that's the what when people say to me like oh where shall i go and get tires and i always say go and go on a respectable website and pick one of the most expensive ones because in general the reason they're expensive is because they've been developed well and they're good and the one thing you should never skimp out on is tires, because as you say, it's it's the what it's only like a probably not even like that much of tread when you're driving along. Like imagine like a little rectangle about that kind of size, and that's the only bit of contact on each fork on, on each corner that you've got. And if you're skimping out on cheap tires, you're just asking to have an accident. Yeah, and it's one thing that you have control, not you've got control of the whole car, but it's decisions that you can make as well. And it isn't just that, it's well, like wet braking performance. Yeah. Comfort, all sorts of stuff. It's such a it's such a bigger deal than people realise. Like tire choice yeah. and stuff like that. It's just it's just it's crazy. Um yeah. annoyingly the the wheel that you've got on yours, the the tire size is so it's such an odd size, it makes tires so expensive. I think when yeah. I bought those I think when I bought PS4s, they were 166 pound a corner, which is ridiculous. Mine not quite... 600 quid for four tires fit. Yeah, mine mine wasn't quite that bad. So my rims are 18 inch rims, and they're seven J with seven inches. So the tire is an 18 by 205, um, and 205 helps it be a little bit cheaper, but the 18 inch part of it keeps the price up a bit. So I think I pay about a hundred and I think it's about 128 per corner, give mm. or take. She's still expensive. Yeah, still a lot of money. But at, at the end of the day, if you have to spend your money on, on anything, tyres are the one thing that you should always put decent money into. And brakes. And brakes, yeah, and brakes. What do you think of those Mintex? They're good. The only thing I'll say is they're quite squeaky. Um, when they're cold, they make a lot of squealing noises. Um, when you get heat in them and, and you... And you if you prop, put firm pressure, the squeaking disappears. But if you're just like lightly braking in traffic and they're cold, it squeaks like a yeah. Did you bed them in? Yeah. Yeah. How did you bed them in? Just sort of driving up to speed and then just sort of braking, like applying sort of half pressure and sort of coming back almost to a stop and then going and then sort of repeating and like doing repetitive cycles of to put heat through them. Yeah, Mintex give a give a, a, an actual bedding in procedure for the M11.4s um, which I have when I, I had a set of mine I haven't done the pads in my JCW yet I um, wanted the pads in my Fiesta um, I followed that procedure and they never squeaked once cold or hot or anything oh fair enough okay probably messed it up a little bit there somewhere then but um, you can get but they break but, but, but they break well enough yeah you know? and when yeah. they're warm they, they don't squeak at all it's just if I'm sort of driving to work in the morning I'm in traffic in Coventry, you know, if I'm sort of at five mile an hour, just come sort of just applying a tiny bit of pressure, come to a stop, it will just squeak in those last sort of couple miles an hour. But apart from that, they're perfectly good. Good. Mm -hmm. well, on the topic of CNN, because I know you mentioned that earlier, there was mm. some news which caused a bit of controversy with on on Facebook, really. And to be fair, it's a mixed views on here actually because we're both locals to CNM, both me and Rob. Jack isn't 
obviously we all have different opinions um you've even worked for the rob so um yeah, yeah. yeah obviously i'm coming from a custom point of view jack's coming from a up north point of view and then rob's coming from uh from sort of the business side and also a customer uh, a regular customer at that you, you you used to go all the time um mm -hmm. i tried to get down as much as possible but like um they like i I've got a busy work schedule anyway, let alone trying to get down to CNM when the booking stuff is sort of, yeah, it's just, yeah. but yeah, what it was, was it so Saturday? people, sorry, go on. Was it Saturdays that they've now started to charge? Evening. So I'll quickly run through what it used to be and then what they've added on for those who don't know what we're on about. So caffeine and machine for a good while now, you've had to pay to go at a weekend um it's 10 pound charge and for that 10 pounds you get three hours of time at a caffeine in machine and it's split up into three time slots um 9 till 12 12 30 till 3 13 and 4 till 7 um that's on a saturday and a sunday the rest of the week you can just turn up whenever and it's free provided it's not an event day or an event evening um and used to be that on Saturdays and Sundays from 7 till close, so from 7 p.m. till 10 p.m., it would then be free to enter, meaning that you wouldn't have to pre-book a ticket. You could just turn up and try and get in. Fair enough, if the car park was full, they'd tell you to go away, and you'd be like, okay, cool, fair. I didn't book a ticket. That's, that's that. I'll go. Um, but commonly Sundays, well, last Sunday was different because I think coronavirus means that people wanted to get out of the house, and it was quite busy. But more often than not, Sunday evenings particularly can be quite quiet. Saturday evenings are busy, but it was nice to be able to go down at a weekend at a time when you didn't have to pay. What they have now done is introduced another £10 for the 7 till 10 time slot. So you can only turn up in an evening by paying £10. And that's before you've bought food or you've bought drink or anything like that. So that's... That's the update, basically. Yeah. And I, I thought it was steep when they started charging. And because it's to, to us, to us, me and Rob, it's, it's a pub. Um, yes, the, there's nice cars that go. But to us, in theory, it's just a pub. Um, we would go there, socialise with our friends. Um, they did have a simulator once upon a time. That broke. That got taken back. Um, mm -hmm. Then they had the merch store. Um Nice food, nice food. Uh, it was a little bit pricey for what you got. Um, you probably got um, a same with food and drink. It's like you're going to a venue. It's not like you're going to a pub um, on the prices. And there's nothing real, really special about it. And they got a very limited menu for that as well, uh, mm -hmm. from my point of view, um, as a customer. Like, but yeah, you got some nice cars. Um, I've, I actually am, I've gone to uh, one um, sort of Japanese kind of night, but that was sort of mid-pandemic. So they did open again uh, when pubs were allowed to open. That was quite good. I didn't think we uh, actually went at the right time because there wasn't many cars there, but there was it was enjoyable still. There was a lot of civics and stuff like that. But yeah, from going from seeing the conception when you didn't have to um, sort of uh, book or uh, sort of pay for a ticket um, that was all well and good when you had the book okay yep yeah, fair enough they want to keep the numbers down because they had a massive problem initially with um, traffic there was cars yeah. everywhere if they were full people would park for miles around and walk there and that's what they tried to stop and that's why that's why they introduced the ticket system um, and it was it was annoying the neighbours to the point of uh the, the police getting called and everything um but then they started charging and then but five pounds but to me then uh then they off once you paid it it was at the top it was at the, at the gate um and you got a key ring or a sticker and in, in exchange you got a free drink you took your token or something you took it and you got a sticker and you got a token you handed the token off um or as a keychain or something and then um, you get a drink, which I think you've got anything on the bar, I believe, anything on tap, whether that coffee, um, Guinness or Coke. Um, 
which, uh, yeah, fair enough. That I, I found that reasonable enough. Then they started not giving anything for five pounds, which I thought was a little bit okay. That that's a bit harsh because, like, I'm going to a pub. I'm I'm going to see my mates. So I'm not I'm not coming to see your venue because your venue's they're relatively tiny. It's not like you've got uh, workshops or anything like that. Um, but then ten pounds. <laughs> 10 pounds is just ridiculous and you don't get anything for that and you only get three hours and they swiftly kick you out um after that 10 that that, that those three hours and oh, i and a lot of people were like well but but you you why you it's 10 pounds it's 10 pounds but for us like 10 pounds yeah we're, we're fairly young um yeah 10 pounds is 10 pounds but 10 pounds especially after the pandemic um is, is probably more scrutinized really because 10 pounds could be two drinks or it could be food or something like that so um and that's what a lot of people on facebook were saying that yeah 10 pounds doesn't seem a lot but actually it, you've got to see it from our point of view and i think it's cut out a lot of clients how uh, especially locals um when the events aren't happening i do yeah i i get with the, the events and stuff like that yes fair enough but you mean like yeah. The, the yeah. event evenings, you mean? The, yeah, the, evenings the specific and specific like night and that yeah. sort of. It, so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, so, so the ten pound. I mean, I fully get why they initially started charging. Um, people before then, people would turn up, stay for a couple of hours, go away, come back with a with a Mackey's and eat it at the venue and, and spend nothing. They wouldn't buy food, they wouldn't buy drink, and they're just using it as a place to park. And that couldn't, that couldn't rest. So a good way to both stop that, or at least limit that, and keep a, a safe cap on numbers was to introduce tickets. Um, um, and it was initially five pound, sure. Then it became 10, okay. But at the time it was still for the day. And then it became that it was only for three hours. But again, it meant that you could get a guaranteed spot because plenty of people would drive a long, a long amount of time to get there and then be turned around because it was too busy. I don't mind the fact that they are charging during the day on the weekends. Yes, it's expensive if you're local, but people say it's just a pub. It is. It has become its own thing. It has in many ways become like a rolling car show. If you're into your cars, you're guaranteed to see something special every time you go. And it kind of has become its own event. The, but the recent thing that annoyed me was the charging in the evening because the evening is, was primarily made up of locals. I understand if you want to charge tickets so that if people are coming a long way, like Jack, if you're coming from somewhere like Yorkshire, you want to make sure you can get a ticket. And that's a good way of making sure that you can get in. But I just think that charging another £10 for an evening is, is sort of the final straw in my opinion. I, I can see at the moment why they're doing it because at the moment people were wanting to get out because they've been stuck inside for so long. So for now, I think it is in some ways quite a good way to keep a cap on numbers to make sure that they don't get over, overrun with stupid amounts of people parking on the side of the road trying to get in. But if it continues for a long period of time, I think it has eliminated CNM as a location for any locals to pop down to in an evening. And I worked there for a year. Um, I was there from day one when they first opened and I finished roughly a year after I started. Um, I went into engineering. It was kind of a gap year for me and I spent the time there, mostly in behind the scenes in the kitchen and that sort of thing. But um, so from their point of view, I can see why they've added another slot, another time slot that you have to pay for on the weekend. But looking at it from an outsider's perspective as a local, it just completely writes off CNM as a location to go to with mates to chill in an evening. Yeah, and to be fair, like I personally haven't felt welcome because at the time, last time I went and last time it was open, I just had a polo and because I only had a polo, I was sort of snubbed. I was sort of, oh, you can go in the back. Like, yeah, I, I knew my car wasn't uh, like the, the greatest or latest or greatest, whatever. But because I turned up in a polo, 
I was then frowned upon. I wasn't in a, a GT2 RS. I wasn't in a 488 or a John Kiv Works or something like that, or M, M5 or M3 or M4. I wasn't in something like that. At that, at that point in time, I couldn't afford it. But now I've got the 3 Series, so it's, it's, it might be kind of different. But I still felt that even though you were handing over so much money, you, you just weren't welcome, especially as a, as a young person. Um, I don't know how you felt, uh, obviously, Rob or, or, or Jack yourself. Obviously, it's a different perspective because you're coming down from, from north. But personally, that's how I felt, that even though I was handing them loads of money, they just they weren't appreciative of it. When, mm. Especially when you're going to be, you're probably 30, 40, 50, 60 quid up or uh, spending when you're going there because you're going to get a couple of rounds of drinks, you, alcoholic or non, and then food and stuff like that. So, and obviously entry now um, in the, in, yeah, it just doesn't sit right with me. Um, I don't know what you think about that, Jack. It's like a completely different perspective that I have because I can see, I can definitely see the side of the, of the, of the, the local stuff because when I initially saw it, and they were saying it's now going to be ten pounds for after seven. I thought ah, that's that's a little bit. Is petty the wrong word? I don't know if petty is the wrong word, but it's a little bit unnecessary. However, I was there on Saturday night, so I was there. I was there Saturday and ended up going back, and it was absolutely rammed. It was busier from seven till ten than it was from twelve till three. It was absolutely round. And from a business point of view, you'd, you'd have stood there and gone, there is th- thousands of pounds here slipping away this just this one evening from all these cars that are coming that are coming through. So I get I, I do get that. And then from my point of view is you know, I might come down um probably five times a year, four or five times a year. So maybe like so sort of, I don't know, once every two months. And for me, it's an expensive trip. It costs me a tank of fuel every time I come down there. Um, and then, so say that's say that's 50, 60 quid. Then it, there's food and drink when you're there. Um, and then if something else happens with my mates that I've got down there and whatever, it's, it, it's, it's the best part of 100 quid for a day. And then for me to have just pay £10 more and get a guaranteed slot, I'm kind of thinking that's 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 fair enough. I'd rather pay that for that for that security. However, if I put myself in somebody's shoe, if I lived, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 miles away, it would really, really annoy me that. Because you would think, okay, from nine till seven, we'll get the people that come from far visit and then they spend loads of money and whatever. And then from seven, you can get your local people like you guys that literally just want somewhere to grab to grab a pint and a catch up and not have to think every time I go there, it's costing me at least 15 quid a go. Cause it'd rack up. It could be like, if you go twice a week, it's 30 quid. Yeah. It's, and it, it's not, it isn't a lot of money in the terms of things that cost a lot of money, but for something that isn't that sort of um, like extreme, you're not asking for much. You're not asking for much, but it's costing you 30 quid by the time you've driven there, bought a drink, driven back. Yeah. And especially for, for people that were there from the start. So I, Bobby used to work there. You know, Zach, I would guess you were there from when it was when it was young, when it wasn't many people there. And and you've been there since day one. You supported it. The term that I'm going to use, and I still don't know if it's a little bit harsh, but I don't know if it's becoming a little bit big, big for its boots. And what you what 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 you what you gain with one hand, you take with the other. So when I went there on Saturday, they had um, two two local businesses running food. Because and I was that I asked why, and they were saying because our, the kitchen there is at CNM is so small and limited, they just can't produce the food, the the volume of food to 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 get out. You know, I was speaking to a lad that worked there. Um, you'll know Henry and he was saying there was a, there was a 50 minute wait on coffee on Saturday morning yeah. 
It's a 50 minute wait on coffee. It's absolutely unbelievable. So imagine if that was food. So what they're doing yeah. there is they're saying to two local businesses, use our use our place as a platform and start and start selling food. Absolutely amazing for the people that get asked to go there or or, or get in touch with CNM and use that platform to start selling food. There was um there was there was a there was a Chinese uh, there was a Chinese one and there was um, an Italian a pizza one, and uh, hats off to them. They were making food from I don't know. They were making food when I got there at one o'clock, and they were still making food at nine. Yeah. And it was at, and they were just out the door, out the door, out the door, and they would have made so much money from that. Yeah. And especially, especially having to get all businesses having to get themselves out the hole of hospitality being shut down. For them, it's absolutely amazing. And yeah. what I've also got to remember is, um, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I presume CNM followed their staff over, over yeah. Corona. Yes. So when I when we first found out that they were charging from seven till ten, I got a little bit cross and I, I, I ranted on Instagram about it. And um, a mate um, who I used to work with at Caffeine Machine messaged me privately and said, like, Yes, but think about the staff and think about the fact that they are running off their feet, which I understand because I work there. I know what it was like to hit the ground running every day. And no matter how much prep you did, the next day it was all going to be for nothing because you're going to be just as busy. And it was a repetitive cycle. It's hard work working there. But if people, are, if, if the argument is that it's too much work for the staff, then either employ more staff or work around a way of making it more efficient because locals shouldn't be penalized for having to spend 10 pounds just so they can keep the numbers down so that the staff can cope that's a staffing issue yeah yeah it's a, it's a staffing issue and it's also a location not location a size issue yes because volume you inherently become with 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 lots of volume in a small place you have efficiently become less efficient you know, mm. I I used to work in a bar when I was when I was seventeen, eighteen, and it was really small. We're a really, really tiny little bar, and we would actually be more efficient and get drinks out faster with less people on the bar. Yeah, if there was five of us, five of us on there. There was literally no room to move, and you were queuing behind the till to try and get to the till. With three yeah. of us on there, or even two, it was just it was just it was just steady and a steady flow. And I think that probably something that would apply to there. Um, Someone again who works there did tell me that they're trying to buy the field behind the gravel car park to extend it. And I said, That's all well and good going from 150 cars to 250 cars. But what do you do about one, the, the way you sell things, i.e., the, the bar that's only small, coffees, can't be really afford to have any more than a 20 minute wait on coffee and even that's a long time food if you're not getting local businesses to come and pitch up which i think they should be doing anyway to be perfectly honest um and, and toilets as well currently there's there's one set of toilets and that is it but they want they're, they're all about expanding to like another 100 cars to, be able to fit in there it's i just don't see yes I don't see how they can do that without building another building on there i just don't, I yeah. don't understand how it works and it's kind of it's, it's kind of taking i had such i had such a great time on saturday i really really did and it was just it, the sun was out and everyone was enjoying themselves and it's it's crazy what a bit of sunshine does for everybody's mood um yeah. and uh phil who, who works who owns it when i when i pulled up he said to me in fact it links into your point zach and i feel like i'm on the opposite end to you weirdly um I, I pulled up having had no co previous conversation with with phil and he he, he knocked on my window and i rolled it down he said he said you parking on the grass i was like uh yeah i can do he said get some sort of move the corner and we'll put your car on the grass and i was like buzzing that's what that's what i wasn't bothered if i was going to park in the car park i was here to be here but that just made it a little bit extra special um whether he knows how long I've driven down for, or my relationship with them having come from such a long way regularly, I don't know. But that was just a really nice gesture from him to to do that, and I and I really respected him for it because he didn't have to at all. 
Um, but I, but that made it a little bit special for me. Um, I don't expect that kind of treatment from them at all. It was just a nice thing to happen. Um, but it, it's a bit, it's a bit of a weird one because they have obviously they have a mantra of of including everybody, but you can progressively see from you from you walk you walk from the road to the TP and then turn right and down the cars in Calibus slowly get worse. Yeah. Now, is that, is that just a natural, I'm trying to think of the word, natural sort of hierarchy isn't really probably the right term, but I don't blame them for wanting the cars that they need to show out the front, really. And a lot of people, in fact, I've had three people in the last week, um, two of which messaged me on Instagram after I'd been down there the weekend, and said, literally said, I'd love to go, but I don't have a nice car. Like, well, what like, I I'd love to go to a football match, but I don't own any football boots. Like, that does not that isn't the point. There's not the point at no. all. Um, no. But I'm guessing from an outsider's point of view and what they see on social media, people automatically think that. People yeah. don't see normal cars in the car park, which yeah. might turn a few not turn a few people away, but like discourage people think, oh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not on the same caliber to pack my car in there, which isn't the case, but it might look that way from the outside. Yeah. That, that, that's the danger of it. And it's it, it, on a much smaller scale, but the club is, I've got a similar example where I've had people message me about the open road club and said, I've only got a insert example, one liter Fiesta, no offense to one liter Fiesta owners, but they say, I've got a one liter Fiesta, can I come? Yes, of course you can come. Doesn't matter what you drive. But inherently, whenever I post on Instagram, obviously it's always the nice looking stuff because that's what does well on social media. But it naturally creates a sense of unease for those people who don't have those cars because they don't think that they can come. And I know 100% as someone who works at CNM, that we do welcome every person and every car. You know, we've had tractors turn up. We had a horse and cart turn up once, you know. We've got everything. And yes, and as Zach said, he's, he's unfortunately experienced a situation where someone has said to him, right, to the back, please. And that's unfortunate and that shouldn't happen. But from, from my point of view, everyone is welcome at my club. And I think CNM would say the same. But obviously, when you go and post things on Instagram showing the best bits, people then think, oh, my car wouldn't be part of that. So that's why I should go. When I went on Saturday, there was some, so you've got the gravel car park on your right-hand side and you've got sort of the grass converted bit on the, mm. on the, on the left-hand side. Arguably, yeah. there were some nicer cars on the, on the grass bit converted car park bit than there was out front. There was mm. uh, so, some, some boys had turned up in, in, in three sort of club sport track, like E92 M3s. It looked absolutely awesome. All three of them there looked absolutely unreal. There was yeah. there was like a, a really dark green R8. There was there was a, like a, a C8 um, RS6. Like I think I've ever seen one of those before. And it was just so it isn't as cut and dry. It's just noticeable. That's 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 all. Um, and I think people shouldn't take offence. Where you where you land because there were some nice guys in the in the other car park as well and and it, it it's a bit awkward because it goes from putting your car on display into a car park yes and it's basically it's it's essentially it's one of the other. I don't think they call it the car park but it kind of that's what it looks like. Yes, it's it's almost like you've got your greatest hits out front and you've got your display. And that's almost like, if you were to imagine it as being at like an NEC car show, the front is like the inside of the car show where you've got all the pretty cars on display that have been polished and they look good. And then round the back is like, you could almost see it as the public car park. And I think maybe not intentional. No, maybe, not, maybe not all the time, but it is noticeable from an outsider's perspective. And then it does make people who haven't got as nice cars think, oh, well, what's the point? Yeah, I mean, it does. I don't think that's anybody's fault as such. I just think if they're, I think from, if I had to give any advice, it would be don't make it any bigger, adapt the space you already have. 
So if they can okay. make that back bit, like where Zach said, he ended up parking in the car, car park bit. If they can make that look more like the front bit, yeah, with a, bit of, with a bit of landscaping and a bit of tarmac and a bit of gravel, and make it make it all look like that. Yeah, like, or give give people more of a reason to go around the back outside of just going around yeah, to see yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. If you were to put if you were to put some food stalls somewhere around the back to give people more of a reason, or maybe some seating, I don't know how they could do it. I'm just brainstorming here. But if you were to put some form of food or toilets, or just give outside of just a reason to go around there just for the sake of curiosity, if you were to force people around that way to go to use an amenity of some form. And that would make that part of the car park and that part of the venue feel more inclusive. Yeah, I think it's in. I think it's in danger of if they if they expand it, it ends up looking more and more like a car park. I mean, I mean, I don't know. You you don't, you don't know the sort of the form of the form of cost involved to to end up landscaping a massive piece of land like that into something that's similar to out front to make it look less like a car park and more like a complete yeah. event area. However. I think it would probably be a worthwhile, a worthwhile investment, and it would make people think. Say, for example, if 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 the whole like ten pound ticket thing carries on for a while, I don't think it. I hope it won't, and I think they kind of put the, in the mantra of when they announced it, they said due to it being so busy, I've sat ticket in and, and whatever, and everyone thought, yeah, fair enough. But I think yeah. they should stop that when things when things tail off probably towards the end of the year and then over the winter provide something to the people that go there and have spent the money that their money has been used as an improvement. Yeah. So I, yeah, I've kept paying 10 pounds twice a week to come here because it's part of my routine and it's part of my, uh, it's part of our socialize. And then if they were to change it up a little bit, add something around the back to make it, more inclusive and more like the front bit. I don't think yeah. people feel feel as, as 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 hard done by. That's why I that's why I suggest whether that happens or not. I don't know. It probably won't. But it sort of to me, it's lost a little bit of innocence almost. But I think it's the same for any business that was to get too big for its space. Unfortunately, it's sort of become, becoming a victim of its own success. Yeah. You, you made the good point earlier about expanding the car park. But of course, what's the point if you can't improve the facilities that are currently there to deal with it? Mm. As you say, it'd be much better to improve on kitchen size or toilet capacity or like a second bar or something to deal with the number because if they're already struggling to deal with the numbers they've got now how's doubling the car park gonna help yeah i mean all completely valid points but i don't want to be i don't want to be too negative about it because it was still no. I, had a, I had a great time and yeah I mean, it's, a, it's a fantastic place and as you say about being invited to go up on the hill been many a time where I've gone there. I think part of it is because I know a lot of people there because I used to work there. But many times when I've been there in an evening, I've sort of immediately been, been pointed to go and park up on the hill. It's very humbling and it's very nice and I love it. And I'm not trying to say that I don't want that. But yeah, I think if they can find out or figure out a way to, to deal with the numbers that they're already experiencing rather than trying to get more and more people in, would be a better way to do it at least for now sort of try and deal with the numbers that you've got rather than just trying to make your problems twice as worse by you know doubling the size of the car park mm, see, i've made i've made a lot of a lot of friends from from going down there and just chatting yeah and to people yeah. when you and i first met it was literally just off the bat of spotting spotting mine or your cars and then got chatting do you know what i mean so yeah yeah and that that those those friendships and that friendship group that I have down there to me is, is completely priceless. Um, if I've got to pay ten pound every time I go down there, it's gonna be ten pound onto what would have been a hundred pound anyway. So it's not the end of the world. But yeah. for me, it is still really really special. However, I I think I'd probably change my tune if I was if I was local and just wanted to nip there for a bit. Mm. I do. Uh, I think I think the I think the after the after seven thing isn't right. To be honest. 
Um, but if it was for if it was for a set amount of time, whilst they got the people, they just made they just took advantage of the the sheer amount of people that are going to want to come down, and then it tails off towards the end, and then they stop it. Then yeah. then that's fair enough. But I think it'd be a real yeah. shame to have a ticketed system all day every day um, for everyone for the first, for forever now. I think that would really take the shine off it. To be perfectly honest. Yeah. And um. Well, that that new grass bit, that that's new. So I think they've built the, the sort of rod their own back anyway, because that wasn't utilised. So at, at least they're utilising that space now. They're growing into it. But yeah, yeah obviously you, you can already already foreshadow what's going to happen if they go and buy that other piece of land, because they're already pissing their neighbours off anyway. Um, and if you can have 250 cars coming in every three hours... You, you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of traffic, and those roads aren't the aren't really designed for that sort of um, that mm. sort of traffic day in or weekend in and out. Like you're gonna you're gonna start pissing a lot of people off. I think there's only so much goodwill and gesture you can do, um, especially when you've just included uh, the prime time uh, local section. <laughs> you, yeah. You've, yeah, so um, I'm I'm not I'm really trying not to um, pick faults or anything like that. I, I do I do really like the place. I I've, I have many a time. We used to go down there twice a week uh, yeah. pre-pandemic. We used to go really regularly because it's a really nice place. But I think yeah, that as as we've discussed, that they're just making a rod for their own backs. But yeah, thank you for watching and. Um, uh, tuning into the second episode of the Open Road podcast. Um, if you didn't get um, sort of your ticket for the first run, there's a second one. Uh, this the date will be on the screen or whatever it is. What is it, Rob? June. It will. It will be Sunday, the third of June. Um, it will start early-ish in the morning. I'm thinking we'll start at around nine ten a.m. But yeah, Sunday, third of June, and tickets will be going out mid to late May. So maybe the second or third weekend of May is when, is when I'm going to put the tickets out. Yeah. It's normally on a Friday as well, isn't it? So I like to try and do it on a Friday at 8pm, but I will give at least a week or two's notice before it goes out so people have time to plan ahead and book a ticket if they really want to get on. Brilliant, brilliant. And thank you, Jack, for coming on and spending an hour and a half just chatting about stuff. No. Uh, well, I mean, someone said to me, "I'm going to spend an hour and a half chatting about cars this evening." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to turn that down." So, no, thank you very much. Yeah, but yeah, you are officially our first guest. Um, and yeah, <laughs> so yeah, um, um, you're definitely welcome back anytime. And um, but yeah, we'll we'll see you at CNM um, shortly, Just hopefully, uh, or in the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and uh, I think that's it. Um, uh, yeah. Bye from us and uh... yeah, there we are. Done. Sorted. Bye bye. Yeah.